أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن طائفتان من المؤمنين اقتتلوا فأصلحوا بينهما فأصلحوا بينهما فإن بغت إحداهما على الأخرى فقاتلوا التي تبغي حتى تفيء إلى أمر الله فإن فاءت فأصلحوا بينهما بالعدل وأقسطوا إن الله يحب المقسطين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The Prophet ﷺ began his prophetic mission. Revelation descended upon him when he was at the age of 40. Which means he spent many decades among his people before he invited them to monotheism. Rasulullah ﷺ lived among the Meccans. He was a member of what we could describe as a polytheistic society. He was living among non-Muslims. One of the unique qualities of the Prophet was that even before he began his mission, he was known in Mecca as someone who was a Muslim. Someone who was always interested in bringing the hearts together. Whenever there was any type of conflict, whenever there was any type of dispute, he always was seen as an impartial judge, as someone who was interested in ending conflict. You find that the Holy Prophet ﷺ, at the age of 20, he was interested in solving the problems in his community. When the Prophet was at the age of 20, he became a member of an organization known as Hilf al-Fudul. Hilf al-Fudul, and I'll, I'll speak about it a little bit, was basically an organization that was a coalition of justice. It was formed when the Prophet was a youth and he joined that organization and he was one of the founding members of Al-Hilf Al-Fudul. Now what, what is the story of this organization that the Prophet founded, that he joined? When the Prophet was in his early 20s, he was about 20 years old at the time, you know brothers and sisters, Mecca was not only the, the place of pilgrimage for people. People used to travel to Mecca, they would perform religious, the religious rites, they would worship, and because it was a religious destination, it became the center of trade and commerce. People used to conduct business in Mecca. 
on one occasion there was a man a Zubaydi man the historians say a man who was not from the tribe of Quraysh you know in Mecca the dominant tribe was the tribe of Quraysh and this major tribe which had over 10,000 members it was broken up it was comprised of smaller clans you know you have Bani Umayya you have Bani Hashim and then you have other clans this individual who was visiting Mecca obviously did not belong to a powerful notable tribe so he comes to Mecca to perform Hajj but he also came with the intention of conducting business he came with merchandise so he travels to Mecca he arrives in Mecca with his goods with his merchandise eager to sell his goods in the marketplace he runs into a man by the name of Al-As bin Wa'il this is you know who this guy he's the father of Amr ibn Al-As who is who becomes the right hand man of Muawiyah so Al-As ibn Wa'il who incidentally is the same person who mocked the Prophet after the Prophet lost his sons and he calls him Abtar that you you don't have anyone who's gonna carry your name and then Allah reveals Surah Al-Kawthar this same man he has such a beautiful track record huh so he sees this newcomer to Mecca and he tells him that can I see the merchandise the goods that you have so he shows him what he has and in Asr bin Wa'il he says that I'd like to purchase all of your goods but I'd like to purchase it on credit meaning I'll take it and I'll give you payment tomorrow so this was like a seventh century credit card right so he takes the goods and he says I'll pay you tomorrow you know my word is good so he says fine so he hands over all of the goods the next day this poor man he comes back requesting payment he says okay I'm here to collect payment for what you purchased from me yesterday Al-Asr bin Wa'il says I'm not gonna pay you who are you Al-Asr bin Wa'il belongs to the powerful tribe of Quraysh and he sees this nobody that you, you don't have anyone who's gonna back you up you don't belong to a prominent tribe so you don't have a support system so he exploited him and how much does this happen today where people who are vulnerable people who are marginalized we trample them but people who have money people who are well known we're careful about how we deal with them not because we fear God because we fear their resources so he refuses to pay the guy so this man he was essentially robbed robbed in broad daylight so what does he do he goes desperately to meet with the heads with the chiefs of Quraysh he brings his case to them he says that I was I was robbed I want him to pay me they all dismissed him I said, Who are you? who's this guy no one helped him so now this man this Zubaydi man he finds himself in Mecca all his merchandise was stolen no one is willing to offer him any help he goes to the Kaaba he stands in front of the Kaaba and in a complete act of desperation he takes off his shirt and begins to cry and saying that oh Quraysh I came to your city and you robbed me and no one is willing to help me so he created a big scene in front of the Kaaba and it created a lot of commotion the Prophet on that day was 20 years old a number of individuals who were embarrassed 
about what happened, who felt a sense of justice, that this is unacceptable, that this is someone who's visiting this holy land. He is our guest. And instead of treating him, with give, offering him hospitality, and treating him and serving him, one of our own robbed him. So a number of individuals came together. Fadl ibn Fadala, Fadl ibn Harith, Fadl ibn Wada'a. And that's why because many of the members, their first name was Fadl, this group became known as Hilf al-Fudul. And among them was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Muhammad ibn Abdullah who was in his 20s. And they solicited the support of many of the clans and five clans within the tribe of Quraysh. They joined this organization. There was one clan that refused, Bani Umayyah. Bani Umayyah refused to join. But you see the Prophet, he joins. And they make a pact that we will uphold the right of an oppressed person no matter who they are. Whether they are Arab, non-Arab, whether they belong to a powerful tribe or they belong to a tribe that we've never heard of. We will uphold the right of a mazloom no matter who it is. And we will stand against a zalim. We will stand against an oppressor even if they are from our tribe. And this takes a lot of courage to speak the truth, to stand up against injustice even it's when your own even if it's being even when it's being perpetrated by your own. And then you see the Prophet ﷺ teaching us a very important lesson in his 20s. The Prophet ﷺ was a member of this organization. He wasn't the president. You know, some of us, we, we refuse to participate unless, unless we have a position. Unless I'm the president. Unless I'm the head of the organization. The Prophet was a member. And who was the Prophet working with? You know, some of us, we can't even work with fellow Shias. Rasulullah is working side by side with who? These are people who were mushrikeen. They were idol worshippers. So you see, the Prophet teaches us that you, some, you can work with people who share an entirely different belief system. You can work side by side with them towards a noble goal. You're working together to achieve something that is noble. You're working towards a higher purpose, which is to establish justice in the community. How many of us are like that? How many of us can set our egos aside and say that I'm going to just be a participant? I'm going to work side by side with people who I don't agree with, but because coming together is going to help us implement justice. We're going to be able to do something that's going to benefit the wider society. That I put my differences aside and I humbly work with others towards a greater good. Even after Rasulullah began his prophetic mission, he used to, he used to talk about the days when he was a member in Hilf al Fudul. What does he say? He says, Laqad shahidtu fi dari Abdullah ibn Jud'an hilfan. Law du'itu bihi fi al Islam la ajabt. The Prophet says that I attended a gathering in the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an and we established a pact. A pact that aimed to uphold justice. The Prophet was proud of being part of such an organization. And he says that if I today, as a Prophet of God, if they invited me to support them, I would participate, I would join them. As Rasulullah today, I would go to the table. If they invited me, if they summoned me, if they called upon me, even though I am the Messenger of God, I'll join them. Because they're working towards something that is noble. So you see the Prophet, he saw that there was a conflict 
There was a problem in the community. There was a fitna that took place. But the Prophet did not remain idle. He worked towards resolving this conflict. Even when it meant that the only way to resolve the conflict was that you have to oppose the most powerful tribe, which is Quraysh. He had to point the finger at his own, his fellow tribesmen and say, no, what you did was wrong. We have to restore his right. We have to be like this, brothers and sisters. This is why he was a sadiq al amin You know, some of us, we want to be leaders in our communities, but we haven't established credibility. We want to be Nabi before we are Amin. We want, we want people to hand us power and responsibility before we've actually done the work. Rasulullah, he had a track record for honesty, for integrity. And therefore, when he made that call, no one could point the finger at his past. He had an established record of advocating for the rights of the, the weak and the disenfranchised. So this is one example. How the Prophet took advantage of the opportunity to bring the hearts together, to restore justice when there's conflict. On another occasion, the, there was another fight that broke out. You know, Arabs, they like to fight. huh? Right. So there was another fight that broke out. I can say that because I'm, I'm Arab, right? So there, there, during when the Prophet was in his 20s and his 30s, the Quraysh, the Arabs came together and they were renovating the Kaaba. They were renovating it. They were raising the height of the Kaaba. They were making some repairs. And as they were making these repairs and these renovations, they had to remove Hajar al-Aswad. They had to remove it from the corner of the Kaaba, the black stone. They made the repairs, and they were finished now. The last thing that has to be done is what? We have to reinstall the black stone. A fight broke out. Why did a fight break out? Because each tribe wants to have the honor of putting the black stone back in its place. Because as I said, Quraysh is made up of many different clans. So there was a lot of shouting and yelling. This tribe is saying that, no, we have a person who is noble in our tribe. says, no, 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 we have someone who is more deserving. We are more, we are more senior to you. We've given more money to the hijjaj that come. You know, some people, because they have money, that's it. Their, their word goes. As if money is like nubuwa, right? You have money and that's it. Whatever you say. So some of the more wealthy, they said, no, we should be the ones to install the black stone. So they're fighting. They can't come to an agreement. So they say, listen, we're not coming to a resolution. Do you all agree? One of them stood and said that, let us defer the decision to the first one who enters Masjid al-Haram. Whoever that person is, we will make him the judge. He will choose the tribe. He will choose the individual who will place Hajar al-Aswad. When Allah wants something to happen, when Allah wants to elevate someone, when Allah wants to make the merits of a person known, Allah, He'll manage it. At that moment, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he enters. The moment, you know, they were at each other's throats. They were literally going to start slaughtering each other. You know, they, they get very emotional. Tensions are running high. Emotions are running high. They're all waiting to see who's going to walk in to the haram, to the masjid. They see it's Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And they all were relieved. They said, al amin Radina, the trustworthy one has arrived. The honest one, the one of integrity has arrived. So they were all happy. 
to have the Prophet resolve this dispute. And this, show, this, this, this is a lesson for us, brothers and sisters. If you want to be a peacemaker, if you want to be someone who's going to reconcile and bring hearts together, you have to be a person of integrity. You have to be an honest person. You cannot be a liar, a hypocrite, a corrupt person. You have to have a good reputation. A reputation of honesty, of integrity. So the Prophet enters. He says, what's happening? He sees everyone's faces are red with anger. The Prophet says, what's the problem? They say, we can't decide who is going to place the black stone. So what does the Prophet do? He sees that everyone's emotions are running high. And everyone, every single tribe wants to have the honor of placing the black stone. What does the Prophet do? So much wisdom. He takes off his abaya, his cloak. And he puts it on the ground. And he says, bring the black stone. They bring it and he says, put it in the middle of the cloth. He places it in the middle and he says, now appoint a representative from each of your tribes and take the end, take one side of the, the cloth. So they all come together and together, together, a few minutes ago they were wanted to kill each other. The Prophet brings them all together and they lift the sheet, they lift the abaya and they walk towards the Kaaba and the Prophet takes it and he installs the black stone. You know brothers and sisters, this, this fight could have led to years and decades of bloodshed. But the Prophet, look at what he does. He turns a conflict into an opportunity for the community to come together. You know, sometimes we automatically think that conflict is bad, we should never have conflict. No, conflict is natural. Con there's always going to be conflict. Just by virtue of living with people, people are different, they have different backgrounds, they have different temperaments, there's going to be conflict. The Prophet doesn't say to these people that, well, you guys are so foolish, you guys are fighting over Hajar al-Aswad. He doesn't make any disparaging remarks. He doesn't say that you people are stupid, you're fools, you're ignorant. Who fights over something so silly? He doesn't say that. He resolves the conflict in the wisest of ways, in a way that appeases all of them. You know, if you can resolve a conflict by making everyone happy and without defying the laws of God, why not? Why not make everyone happy? Why not make everyone feel like it's a win-win situation? So you see the Prophet, when you look at his seerah, the Prophet ﷺ of the oppressed. Now, when there is conflict in the community, when there's fitna, sometimes the truth becomes obscure. You know, there are certain cases where there's a conflict. Two people are fighting. Two groups are fighting. And it's very clear who is right and who is wrong. In that case, you don't remain neutral. You support those who are right and you oppose those who are wrong in a, in, in a very civilized way. But what do you do when there's a conflict and it's not clear? And this happens a lot. If you go to Nahjul Balagha, there's a beautiful statement by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Salawatullahi alayhi You know Nahjul Balagha as you, many of you know it's a collection of the sermons and the letters and the sayings of Ali ibn Abi Talib not all of them Sharif al radhi who was interested he was a uh, he was interested in Arabic literature he loved Arabic rhetoric Balagha so he selected the sermons and the letters and the sayings that reflected the literary beauty of the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So don't think that Nahj al Balagh is all, the, a compilation of all of the Imam's sermons and letters and sayings. It's a, it's a collection of those statements that have literary beauty, that have outstanding literary beauty. If you go to the first saying, 
In Najul Balagha, the Imam السلام, addresses the issue of fitna. How to respond to fitna. Because fitna is not going to break a community. As I mentioned, conflict is natural. But the way we respond to fitna can destroy the community. The Imam السلام, he says, Kun fil fitnati كابن اللبون لا ظهر فيركب ولا ضرع فيحلب The Imam alayhi salam he says in times of political strife in times of fitna be like the young camel of two years be like a two year old camel neither has he a strong back to be mounted nor does it have udders for you to milk it now what is the imam talking about you know the imam alayhi salam sometimes he employs physical references he speaks about objects that we're familiar with that the arabs were familiar with and he conveys lofty truths through these examples so the Imam so in order to understand what the Imam is saying we have to understand the the nature of a two-year-old camel because Arabs were very familiar with with camels it was their mode of transportation it's like today using an example of a car they were very familiar with it why a two-year-old camel? You know, if you look at the life cycle of a camel, when a camel gives birth, and that baby, that calf, reaches the age of two, two years old, we call that, that two-year-old camel, Ibn al-Labun. to another baby, so Ibn al-Labun is a two-year-old camel whose mother is, is giving milk to its younger sibling. So you have this two-year-old camel. Now why does the Imam mention a two-year-old camel? This Ibn al-Labun is two years old. It's not a baby anymore, meaning it doesn't need milk from its mother anymore. And nor is it an adult. So it's neither an adult, nor is it a baby. So a two-year-old camel, what makes it unique is the fact that you can't use it. Meaning, its back is not strong enough for you to ride on it. And it's not, the back is not strong enough for you to put any goods on top of it to carry any load. Nor is it able to produce milk. So you cannot do anything with it. You cannot use it. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, when there is fitna, and the truth is not clear, you don't know who's right and who's wrong. And it happens, brothers and sisters. Sometimes there's a fight that breaks out in the community. And people start taking sides, and they don't even know what the conflict is yet. Who's right and who's wrong isn't clear yet. But what happens? People start aligning themselves with their friends, with members of their family. How can you align yourself with a group when you have not even understood the conflict? So the Imam السلام, says, you have to be like this Ibn al-Labun, you have to be like this, this two-year-old camel where you're not exploited. No side can use you. They can't ride you. They cannot, they cannot exploit you. So the Imam alayhi salam here, he says, sometimes when there is conflict, you have to be neutral. When, do you be, when are you supposed to be neutral? When haq is not clear. When you don't have all the facts. You have to reserve judgment. You cannot align yourself. You cannot say, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm with these people. You have, Allah is going to hold you responsible. How can you align yourself with a group without hearing the facts? So if something is obscure, 
Your responsibility is to be like this two-year-old camel. That you're neutral. You don't take sides. Now some people, when they read this hadith, they misunderstand it. They think that whenever there is fitna, I have to be neutral. In many cases, many in many cases, when there's a conflict, those who are right, it's clear who's right and who's wrong. If haq and batil, if truth and falsehood is clear, you're not allowed to remain neutral. You have you have to take sides, and you have to take the side of the truth. You know this was the problem that Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam faced. The Imam alayhi salam was rising up against the Umayyads, and he would meet with companions of the prophets, people who were religious, who were pious. But what were they? What were they doing? They were trying to main, remain neutral at a time in which they should have taken a position. They should have taken a stance. Because it's very clear who's on haq and who's on batil. You're not allowed to sit on the fence when the truth is apparent from the falsehood. Now, we mentioned that even during the time of the Prophet, you know, if you look at the Qur'an, the Qur'an teaches us how to deal with conflict in our communities. There's a surah, the ayah that I began with is from Surah Al-Hujurat, the, the verse that I began the lecture with, Surah Al-Hujurat, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا Ayah number 9, Surah number 49. And Surah Al-Hujurat is a unique surah, صلوا على محمد وعلي محمد. Surah Al-Hujurat is a unique surah because it is a chapter in the Qur'an that gives Muslims their moral code of conduct. Some scholars refer to it as Surah Al-Akhlaq Wal-Adab, the chapter of ethics and manners. And the surah is divided up into three sections. It has 18 verses. The first five verses Allah teaches, if I can ask the sisters to keep the children, the voices down, Ahsantum. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. The first five verses, Allah teaches the Muslims about the proper way to interact with the Prophet. The proper etiquette when you interact with Rasulullah. Verses 6 through 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how Muslims are supposed to treat each other. You know, being a good Muslim is not only about respecting the Prophet. You know, there are some people, they respect Ahlul Bayt. They have reference for the Prophet and the, and the Ahlul Bayt. But they disrespect everybody else. In verses 6 through 12 of Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah teaches us how to create an atmosphere of brotherhood and sisterhood. What things you should do and what things you should avoid. In ayah number 9, Allah speaks about an incident in which Muslims, during the time of the Prophet, in the ninth year after the Hijrah, so these are not new Muslims, these are some of the senior companions of the Prophet. A fight broke out. And when I say a fight, I'm not just talking about you know insults. There was physically a fight that broke out. Blood was shed. There was a brawl among two groups. There was fighting. You know, we think that, you know, we only fight. D during the time of the Prophet, they were wrestling each other. Alhamdulillah, I haven't seen anyone wrestle, anyone here at this masjid so far. So there was fighting. Allah reveals the following verse. What are you supposed to do when Muslims are fighting each other? Some of us, what do we do? We fan the flames, right? There's a fight that breaks out in the masjid and people start taking out their phones. They want to record it and put it on Instagram, right? This is what Allah teaches us. Allah reveals this verse. Listen to the ayah. وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا When two groups, 
two believers, two groups of believers fight each other. Iqtatalu. They're physically attacking each other. Wa in ta'ifatani min al mu'minin. Two groups of believers. Notice Allah still calls them mu'minin. They're fighting each other, but Allah still calls them mu'minin, which is a lesson for us. You know, sometimes when we get into an argument, we have a tendency to do what? Look at this munafiq. Look at this kafir mushrik. Yeah, we do takfir of each other. Right? I remember I went to a community and there was a disagreement between some brothers. And there was a lot of there was a lot of grud, there were grudges between them. One brother says, Shaykh, this guy is Shinar. I said, His name is Shinar? He said, No, he's like Shinar. We name call each other. We take each other outside of the fold of Islam when we fight. Allah says, Don't do that. Just because you have conflict, it doesn't mean that the person who you're, you have a conflict with, with is automatically non Muslim. That you, that you treat them as an apostate. When two groups are fighting, what should you do? Make peace. Try to reconcile. Don't add fuel to the fire. Some of us were experts at adding fuel to the fire. If you don't know what the conflict is about, you should stay neutral. If you are hot-headed, you should stay neutral. If you don't have a good reputation in the community, you should stay neutral. Allow people who are respected in the community, who have a track record of integrity and honesty, allow them to come forward and do islah. But don't interfere in the process of reconciliation. فَأَصْلِحُ بَيْنَهُمَا So now, listen. So, imagine these two groups are fighting. Certain people come forward and they make peace. They come to an agreement. They make compromises and they come to an agreement. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى Now what do you do if we make peace and then one group continues to antagonize? Here Allah says what? فَقَاتِلُ الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيءَ إِلَىٰ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ Now, you cannot remain neutral. Now, the entire community has to oppose the group that broke the agreement, that went against what they agreed on. فَقَاتِلُ الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيءَ إِلَىٰ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ you oppose them, you try to advise them, you bring them back to civility, and if they do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَقَاتُلُ الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيءِ إِلَّا أَمْرِ اللَّهِ فَإِنْ فَاءَتْ فَأَصْلِحُ بَيْنَهُمَا If they stop their aggression, make peace. Meaning, don't hold grudges. Sometimes we hold grudges. We have a disagreement. We had a fight. And we hold it against the person until Yawm Al Qiyamah. We don't let it go. We don't let it go. We have to learn to give up these grudges, brothers and sisters. Allah says, فَأَصْلِحُ بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَأَقْصِطُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُخْصِلِينَ Allah loves the just people. He loves those who, who get rid of the grudge. You know, even when we enter Jannah, we ask Allah to grant us paradise. What does Allah say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before He allows people to enter paradise, what does He say? Allah azza wa jal, He says, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرُورٍ متقابلين. Allah says, before mu'mineen are allowed entry into paradise, Allah says, I extract the animosity that is in their hearts. Now you may tell me, does a mu'min have animosity in his heart? Yes, it's possible. It's possible that you have ill feelings towards one another. A mu'min might have ill feelings, they might have animosity, but they don't act on it. Allah says that, I, I don't allow people to enter Jannah until I remove all traces of animosity and grudges in their hearts. Because even Jannah, huh? Even Jannah cannot be enjoyed if there is animosity in the hearts. 
Jannah with all of its amenities and the beautiful weather and the palaces, if you have ghil, if you have this concealed grudge, this animosity, you won't enjoy paradise. So Allah removes it from the hearts. Now, time is running out, but how do we practically, how much time do we have left? 10 minutes? 7 minutes? Imdad is very precise. 7 minutes. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. How do you practically engage in conflict resolution? You know, people when there's conflict, they tend to respond to conflict in one of three ways. Most people, when there is conflict, what do they do? Because most people are uncomfortable with confrontation. They're uncomfortable with conflict. What do they do? They respond to conflict by avoiding it. They avoid the person, they avoid the topic. Because it's uncomfortable for them. They just pretend, they just sweep it under the rug. They avoid it. But what happens when you do that? It festers. It festers and it will manifest itself in a more violent way. Number two, there are some people who respond to conflict by being aggressive. There's a conflict and what do they do? They respond to this conflict. They react to conflict by being verbally abusive, by maybe even being physically abusive. If you respond to conflict by being aggressive, you're not going to solve anything because the other side is going to become defensive. You're just adding fuel to the fire. So how do you respond to conflict? And this is something that very few people have mastered. Non-aggressive conflict resolution. Now I'll give you a very simple example. <clears throat> Imagine at this masjid, there's a problem. Let's say that the problem is, just for the sake of example, the problem is there is a committee that doesn't clean the masjid. Every time there's a program, the masjid is trashed and the responsibility of cleaning the masjid falls on one person. So this is a conflict, this is a problem. And this person who's always having to clean the masjid, no one helps him out, has an issue now. How do you resolve this conflict? So there's, imagine there's a committee that's supposed to be doing this, but it always falls, falls on, the response, on the shoulders of one person. There's an acronym that cognitive behavioral therapists, they give as the steps to resolve conflict. They say it's, it's STABEN. S-T-A-B-E-N. Number one, you first have to identify the source of the conflict. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we, we join in on the fitna and we don't even know what the problem is. What is the source of the conflict? So in this case, we're talking about cleaning the masjid, the source of the conflict is what? The committee who is failing to do its job. That's the source of the conflict. So that's S. The next one is T. When there's a conflict, you have to choose the right time and place to speak about the conflict. You have to choose an appropriate time. Because time and place is going to determine whether you're going to be able to resolve the conflict. It's probably not a good time to bring up the conflict in the middle of the majlis. Or in the middle as we're about to do our congregational prayers on a day when people are fasting and they're tired. So choose a time that is appropriate to bring up the issue. A time when people are relaxed, they're not emotional, they're calm, and we can discuss the issue in a very productive way. So time and place. Number three, so STA, amicable approach. What does this mean? Amicable approach is basically a fancy way of saying that when you want to resolve a conflict, if you have a conflict with a person or a group, start off by recognizing the positive things that they do. Right? If you want people to be receptive, you don't come into the meeting with all guns a blazing, you never do this, you never do that, you are wicked, you're a shimmer of the judge, you're not going to get anywhere. Meaning that if there's a committee that's responsible for cleaning the masjid and you want to bring this issue to them that they're not fulfilling their duty, you say that 
last Ramadan, I really appreciated how much work you guys did to make the programs run smoothly. When you compliment, when you say something positive, people let down their guard. They are much more likely to listen. They're going to be receptive. So this amicable approach. And then the next is number four, behavior. You have to, brothers and sisters, identify the behavior that is upsetting you. And don't use absolutes. So for example, if you've been cleaning the masjid and the committee has failed to do so, you need to be very specific. Don't use absolutes. Don't say, you guys never clean the masjid. Because if you do that, they get defensive. Say, for example, last Friday I had to stay late and clean the masjid because no one in the committee was here. And I don't and so you identify the behavior that is bothering you. And then number five, and this is difficult, emotion. You have to be able to articulate how that is making you feel. So you identify the behavior that is causing the conflict, and then you say what? That I feel frustrated that these responsibilities are falling on my shoulders. You're not pointing the finger and blaming. You're not using insulting language. You're articulating how you feel. And sometimes you have to think for a little bit. Sometimes you think that you're angry, but in fact you feel hurt. So you have to think about how you feel and you have to articulate that. And then the final step in conflict resolution is what? And what do you need? You have to be able to articulate what you need to resolve the problem. A lot of times we fight with each other and we don't even know what we want to change. We're just angry. We, we lump all of these conflicts into one conflict and we want to try to resolve it. Tackle one conflict at a time. And I'll end with this. If you are able to do this, if you're able to bring peace between two people or two groups who are fighting, I'll mention two ahadith very briefly. Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sallallahu alayhi He says, and this is a lesson for us, for Shia Muslims who fight with each other and argue and create problems. Imam says, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ بَيْنَ اثْنَيْنَ مِنْ شِيَعَتِنَا مُنَازَعَ Imam al-Sadiq, listen to this. He says, if you see two Shias fighting each other, they have a conflict. The Imam says, فَافْتَدِهَا مِنْ مَالِي The Imam says, come and take some of my money to resolve the problem. Imagine. The Imam says, use my money if you have to, to, to make the peace between them. The Imams don't want us to fight with each other. The Imams don't want us to, to get so emotional and we start threatening each other with lawsuits. This is haram. This is unacceptable. This is not what the Ahlul Bayt have taught us. And a final comment, when Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi alayhi when he was on his deathbed, he gave his final wasiyah. One of the things that the Imam mentioned, he looks at Hassan and Hussein, and he says to them, and when the Imam is speaking to Hassan and Hussein and his children, he's also giving us advice, because he's our spiritual father. He says, reconcile the differences of people. Make peace between people. Why? فَإِنِّي سَمِعْتُ جَدَّكُمَا يَقُولُ Because I heard your grandfather, the Messenger of God, say, صَلَاحُ ذَاتِ الْبَيْنِ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ عَامَّةِ الصَّلَاةِ وَالصِّيَامِ Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, that I heard your grandfather, the Messenger of God, say, that the one who makes peace between two people who are fighting, Allah will reward them. That action is better in the eyes of God than one year of mustahab prayers and one year of mustahab fasts, of recommended fasts and prayers. Look at how much effort we put into doing all of these supplications and these extra prayers. If you want to gain that reward, make peace between two people who are in conflict. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad 
وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين